Welcome to this introduction to Microsoft Access 2010. While these tutorials are designed for the user who has never touched Microsoft Access, they may also benefit those of you with limited exposure to the program. Perhaps you have taken a job in which you've inherited a former employee's database and are tasked with updating it. You'd like to understand how the database was put together in the first place so that you can manage and manipulate the data in it more effectively. In these tutorials, you'll learn what databases are designed to do and how they're constructed. Many people new to Access have used Microsoft Excel for various projects and wonder how the two programs differ. You will learn here what kind of information that often ends up in a spreadsheet might be better suited for database storage. With that knowledge, we'll examine a database that has already been created. Then, I'll use what we learn from studying that database to create a small, simple scratch database. Finally, I'll show you how to convert an Excel spreadsheet into Microsoft Access. I'm going to start with a basic introduction to how Access databases work. To help explain the structure and purpose of a database, let's start out by looking at a spreadsheet in Microsoft Excel. Because so many more people have a working knowledge of Excel than they do of Access, folks sometimes use Excel to store information that is actually better suited to a database. Excel is a workhorse of a program that could accommodate much of the data stored in an Access file. However, it doesn't do so nearly as efficiently. And it doesn't give the user the ability to manipulate the data to extract the kinds of information that can be accomplished in a database. Take a look at this old spreadsheet from Himmelfarb Library's Serials Department. It's a tiny sampling of journal titles, along with additional relevant information, such as the journal supplier, subscription method, and whether or not these journals are available for other libraries to borrow from Himmelfarb through interlibrary loan. Note the frequent repetition of data throughout the various columns. Does this look familiar to you? Let's examine some of the repetition. There are roughly a half dozen possible subscription options that the library uses, as seen in the subscription method column. Notice how many times each option has been typed throughout just the screen capture, and the entire spreadsheet lists more than 2,800 titles. Data entry was an exhaustive and highly repetitive process. Similar repetition occurs in other columns of this spreadsheet, as you can see. Notice how many times Academic Search Elite appears in the Journal Supplier column, and how about Publisher slash Aladdin in the Access Option column. Frequent repetitive data entry in a spreadsheet wastes time and energy and can result in errors. A spreadsheet such as this is a strong candidate for conversion to a database. Let's see how much more efficiently data entry works in Microsoft Access. The information in a database is not laid out on one big sheet, as in Excel. Rather, a database is made up of individual tables containing related information that communicate with one another. The tables correspond to the columns we saw in the spreadsheet. The repetitive data we saw in the Excel columns is instead entered once in separate source tables. The data in these tables then feeds into a central table that contains all the categories or fields that we saw in the spreadsheet. Each journal supplier is entered once and only once in the journal supplier table. Every time the main table wants to list a particular supplier, it looks up the name from the source table and selects it. If a new journal supplier comes into play, I would add its name to the journal supplier table and then the central table can access it. Think how much more efficient this process has become. This screenshot gives us a perfect illustration of a database, an online catalog. Each record that you pull up when performing a search contains a set of related information about the item, title, author, publisher, 
applicable subject listings that pertain to the title, item type, for example, a book or a DVD, and location, for example, in the book stacks or on the reserves shelf. The highlighted categories in this screenshot contain highly repetitive data in the catalog. Based on the previous example, how would you design this catalog's database? By creating a series of source tables. The repetitive categories are organized into separate source tables that link to the central table, the bibliographic record. Each publisher I own titles from is typed once in a publisher info table. When the cataloger is creating a record for the newly purchased item, she links to the publisher table, finds the publisher from the list, and selects it. It's then entered in the item record. If she receives a book from a brand new publisher, she will enter that name in the publisher table and then link to it. What are the advantages of typing the publisher name only once and then linking to it as needed versus typing the name directly into the item record each time? It saves typing. It increases accuracy by eliminating repetitive data entry. It also promotes consistency in the data entry. Some may, for instance, spell out a word such as company, whereas some others taking over the data entry might spell it CO. How exactly do tables in a database link to and communicate with each other? Simply put, two tables in a database can talk to each other if they have a category or field in common. Let's look at the example at hand. The item type, location, and subject list tables are pretty bare bones. They only contain one field a piece, item type in the item type table, location in the location table, and subject in the subject list table. But what is crucial is that each of these fields also appears in the central table that is the complete bibliographic record. The source tables that are feeding information into the central table are sometimes referred to as parent tables, and the tables feeding from that source table are referred to as child tables. The publisher info table has a little more meat on its bones as it has four fields, publisher, contact, website, and phone number. Does it have a field in common with the central table? Yes, the publisher field. And, as in the six degrees of separation game, because each table has a link to some other table in the database, all tables in this database are considered related and can communicate with one another, whether they have a direct link to each other or not. The item type and location tables don't share a field in common with each other. However, each has a field in common with the central table. Therefore, these two tables are linked and can share information. All tables become related or interconnected. This becomes important because it enables a process called querying, which I will discuss later on. And now a little database speak. When a field appears in two tables, it's given a special name depending on which table it's in. The field located in the source or parent table for example, item type in this illustration, is referred to as the primary key. The same field located in the child table is referred to as the foreign key. In the location table, which is a source table, the location field is considered the primary key. In the item record table, which pulls information from the location table, the location field is referred to as the foreign key. Every table has a primary key, and when a table has multiple fields, the field chosen for this honor is usually the one on which the table is based. In a table called Publisher Info, which is the logical candidate to be primary key? That would be the publisher. The phone number, website, and contact fields are supporting fields used to provide additional information about the publisher. The primary key field must contain unique entries. Duplicate entries in this field are not permitted. 
Why is this important? Well, when looking up a particular record in a table, folks depend upon the primary key to ensure they're pulling the correct record. The primary key is what positively identifies that the record found is indeed the record being looked up. What would happen if GW's payroll department were instructed to garnish the wages of employee John Doe because he's behind in his alimony payments? If the payroll database uses employee names as a primary key field, and GW employs two John Doe's at the university, one of whom isn't even married, there's a chance that someone at payroll may pull up the record for the wrong Mr. Doe. Not good. However, payroll knows better and uses GWIDs as primary keys. No two people share the same GWID. So the folks at payroll will know they've gotten their man. If primary keys still seem too abstract or hard to grasp right now, please don't worry. They will become clearer when we explore an actual database and when I create a database from scratch. When two tables are linked to each other, they are said to have a relationship. We'll explore the anatomy of a relationship a bit later on when I open a sample database to look under its hood. Data entry into cell after cell in a grid layout can result in eye strain, as you may know if you've created large spreadsheets in Excel. The tables in Microsoft Access feature the grid format. To reduce screen clutter, Access gives you the option to enter the data for your table in an easy to read form. Which would be easier for you to type information in? This? or this. Forms such as this one link directly to their associated tables so that information typed in the form is added simultaneously to the table. Why might forms be better for data entry? The interface is much cleaner because Access only displays data entry fields for one record at a time. When you have completed entry for a record, you simply click on the right-facing arrow on the navigation bar at the bottom of the form to bring up a blank form screen onto which you can enter data for the next record. Do you remember the brief reference I made to querying in databases when I was speaking of relationships between tables? Querying is the most powerful feature of a database as it enables the user to focus in on all the data entered in a database and then ask questions of it. Since tables in a database are connected, you can combine any data from among those tables in whatever way you need. Let's take as an example a company's payroll database. It has salary information for every employee so if the head of the company wanted to know how many of her employees in the sales department make over X amount in annual salary, she would query the database, asking it to display employee records based on criteria she sets, in this case, all employees who are listed in the database's department field listed as sales, and all employees who have annual salaries above X amount as listed in the employee salary field. Access would extract only the records that match her criteria and would display them in a new table. Let's look at another example of querying using the library's online catalog. Let's say we wanted to search the catalog for items related to heart sounds. We might get a robust list of books, videos, DVDs, audio CDs, and so on. But say we only wanted heart sound materials in audio CD format. We can query the online catalog by selecting Power Search and then entering in the information that will limit the search. By entering heart sounds in the words or phrase field and then by restricting the item type field so it only displays results listed as being in audio CD format we are filtering out books, journals, DVDs, and other undesired material types. And here's what we end up with. A list of titles that matches the criteria we've set, and nothing that doesn't match. 
three items extracted from a database containing thousands of titles. Remember that journal spreadsheet we looked at earlier that was then converted into Access? Here it is again. Notice that this database contains a total of 2,846 records. Let's say the library cataloger wants to see a list of all journals that are supplied by the company Ingenta and that have print subscription and free online access as their subscription methods. A query in which we limit the data to that which matches both criteria will give us this. Now look at the total number of records displayed, 44. You save the trouble of having to sift through and highlight these titles from a list of nearly 3,000. Much time and energy saved. Using the same journal's database, let's try querying it for all cancer titles that are available to other libraries through interlibrary loan. Voila! Now let's say that a faculty member from Howard University needs this information. What's a nice way to present it to him other than sending him a screen capture such as this? You can create and print a formatted report for him that contains the very information you just obtained through your query. Here's what it might look like. Reports can be made from any table or query or combination thereof. They are intended for printout, so the information lays out in a stylish and easy to read format. And there are a number of formatting options to choose from. Another benefit of creating a database is that you can revise a piece of data and that revision will cascade throughout all tables, queries, and reports in which it appears. Himmelfarb Library purchases many titles from the publisher Lippincott, Williams, and Wilkins. Well, they used to be Williams and Wilkins. Imagine that Williams and Wilkins appears in various tables, queries, and forms throughout your database, and then you get the news that Lippincott is in the picture. It would be more than a little tedious to have to update the publisher's name everywhere it appears throughout the database. In Access, you can go straight to the publisher table, the source table, update the publisher's name, and guess what? The change ripples throughout the entire database. Update it once in one place, and it updates everywhere. Now that you've had an introduction to the structure and function of a database, we'll use that knowledge to examine a simple database that has already been created. You will see under the hood to learn how it was put together and how relationships are set up. I will then add new records to the database and create queries and reports. You'll find Microsoft Access by going to Start, selecting All Programs, going to the Microsoft Office folder, and then clicking on the program icon. To open a pre-existing file, make sure that the File tab is currently open, and then choose Open. Search for your document. Mine is saved on the desktop. And then double-click on the file to open it. When you open the database, you'll see a security warning beneath the ribbon. Access explains the database content that could be harmful has been disabled. If you trust the source of the database, you can enable the content by clicking Enable Content. By not clicking it, you will be unable to access certain features that would involve the disabled active content. You may get additional security warnings asking if you want to make the database a trusted document. For instance, if the database is located on a network server and therefore vulnerable to malicious programming by others. If you feel safe to do so, you can click Yes, which means that the database will open in the future without any warnings or prompts about potentially harmful content. 
The database you see contains a list of heart sounds resources available at Himmelfarb Library. I'm going to open one of the tables listed here so we can look at the access screen. The ribbon, which spans the top of the access screen, replaces the old menu bar and toolbars used in Microsoft Office programs up through version 2003. It organizes related functions into tabs. Those related functions are further organized into groups. The Home tab, for instance, has a text formatting group that contains formatting options for adjusting font, font size, boldface, underline, and italics. The Quick Access Toolbar is a customizable toolbar at the top of the screen that provides access to commonly used functions such as Save or Undo Last Action. Clicking on the down arrow gives you access to other common functions that you can add to the toolbar. Contextual command tabs provide access to options that pertain to a just completed action. If you open up a table, for instance, a Table Tools tab appears, offering you functions for manipulating the datasheet. This tab would not be necessary if the table were not open, and so it vanishes from the screen once you close the table. The Navigation pane is the area on screen where you go to access your tables forms, queries, reports, etc. Clicking on the down arrow in the upper right corner of the pane provides access to these various objects. Currently, this database only contains tables, four in total. The main table is the bibliographic record table containing title, author, and publisher information, among other things. The three other tables are source or parent tables. The publisher table lists publishers as well as their contact information. The item location and media type tables list where in the library each item is housed and what type of material it is, book, CD, DVD, etc. To the right of the navigation pane is the area where the currently opened table, form, or query, or report displays. The table displaying here is the item location status table. Let's look at it. It contains only one category or field, as they're called in database speak. The column heading text is cut off a bit, so I'll stretch it so we can see what it says. I'll click on the border and drag to the right to expand the column. The column lists the various possible item locations for the Heart Sounds resources. To see how this table was created, I'll click on the Design View icon. It's the icon displaying the protractor, pencil, and ruler in the upper left corner of the window. Design View is where I set up the column headings, the fields. I also configure data entry for each column based on the data type. Let me show you. The only field for this database is item location and status, and it's entered in the top left row of the grid. Next door to the field name column is the data type column. Notice that the data type for this field is text. I'll click on text to bring up a down arrow. Clicking on the down arrow reveals various data types available to choose from. You would choose text for simple text fields, Let's look at a few of the other data types listed. Memo is for text that exceeds 255 characters in length. Numeric data is for numbers being used in calculations, excluding currency. 
It is not used for street addresses, social security numbers, or other types of numbers which are not used in calculations. Date time is a self-explanatory data type, as is currency. Auto numbers are usually sequential auto-generated numbers, each which uniquely identifies a record. A new number is automatically generated as each new record is created. The yes-no data type is used in fields where the entry can be only one of two values, such as yes-no or true-false. We'll skip over the next couple as they aren't used so much in simple databases. The last is the lookup wizard. This is a field that allows you to choose an entry from another table or from a list of values that you determine. We'll be examining this data type in more detail shortly. The description column is optional. It allows you to type in text to further identify what goes into the particular field it's associated with. Field properties in the Design View screen allow you to control how data is entered in the fields of your table. If, for instance, you set the data type to date time, you can dictate in field properties exactly how a date should be typed. For example, you may want all years to be typed out completely rather than entered using only the last two digits. Field property options vary depending on the data type you are working with. In the current table, where my data type is text, and I'll click here on it, Access offers more than a dozen properties that you can adjust as needed. Let's look at the ones you'd be most likely to be concerned about. Field size limits how many characters or numbers you can type in an entry. The default maximum is set to 50 characters. Format sets a consistent pattern for how various types of data display. For instance, regardless of how a date is entered with hyphens or slashes, it will appear uniformly as one way or the other. Predefined formats are not available for text fields. The input mask establishes a pattern for how non-calculated numbers, phone numbers, zip codes, social security numbers, for example, or dates and times are to be entered. For instance, you may choose a pattern in which the entry of years must include all four numbers, 2013, rather than just the last two, 13. Data entered incorrectly will be rejected. The caption is the label for a field used in place of the field name where desired. Field names are usually typed without spaces in order to speed up data processing. So you might choose to type the caption phone space number to appear as a label in your tables, forms, reports, etc. rather than the field name, which is phone number without a space. Notice in this table that item status location is written without spaces in the field name column. I've therefore created a caption for item location status that includes spacing. It is this caption that will appear in the table. Required designates whether data entry is required or not in a particular field. Indexing marks the data in selected fields for faster sorting and searching. If you index a last name field, it will be quicker in a large database to search out that name from amongst all the records. Note, field properties may display down arrows with drop-down menu lists, or in the case of input masks, you'll be prompted to click on the Build button to the right of the window after you've clicked inside the Input Mask field property, as you see here. I won't click on it just yet. You'll notice a little gold key next to the field name. This image represents the primary key. As mentioned in the introduction, a primary key is used to establish links between tables that allow you to combine and retrieve data from them. It is a field that uniquely identifies each record in your table. A social security number field, for instance, could be used as a primary key field in an employee database, since no two people have the same one. A primary key is all but essential for your database to operate efficiently. 
if the field you wish to use as your primary key cannot be guaranteed to contain all unique entries, you may set up an auto number ID field. In this, each entry is assigned its own number, one, two, three, and so on. The numbers are meaningless in and of themselves. They simply serve to provide each record with a unique identifier. This minimizes the risk that the wrong record will be pulled into another table by accident. If employee last name were designated as a primary key, for example, there could be two or more people who share the same last name, and the database operator wouldn't know clearly which record is the one to select. You'll learn how to set up a primary key a little later on in the tutorial. I'll now click on Datasheet View in the upper left corner of the window. Do you see how item location status appears with proper word spacing? It's displaying the text as written in the caption. Now I'll close out this table. I'll click on the X in the upper right corner. Let's look briefly at the media format table. I'll double click on it to open the file. All of the library's media formats are listed in the media format column. Now let's look at the design view by clicking on its icon. Here again, media format is spelled as one word in the field name column, but is spelled as two words in the caption field property. And this is how it will read in the table. I'll return to the table's datasheet view and then close out the table. Next, I'll open up the publisher table. You can see that it has several more column headings or fields than do the first two tables we looked at. Click on the Design View icon and we'll see how this table has been constructed. The four fields are listed in the Field Name column. Notice that each of them has been assigned a text data type, even the phone number field. Although there is a number data type, you may remember that it is only used for numbers you are performing calculations with. A phone number is treated as straight text. I'll click on each of the field names and then see if any field properties were modified. Publisher and Website have no special settings beyond the defaults. You'll notice that for contact name, a caption has been added that spaces the two words apart. When I click on phone number, you'll see again that a caption has been created, but additionally, you'll notice something that looks rather odd in the input mask field, various punctuation marks and some nines and zeros. It kind of resembles a phone number, but what do all those punctuation marks have to do with anything? If I click inside the input mask field, a build button appears to the right. I'll click on that to bring up an input mask wizard. As mentioned earlier, the input mask sets rules for how non-calculated numbers such as dates and phone numbers are entered in a field. For instance, to display 9, 25, 1925, you might require users to type it as 09251925. If a value is entered incorrectly, Access rejects it. Here, an input mask has been created to dictate how phone numbers must be entered. Phone number is currently selected, so I'll just click Next. The default shows parentheses around the area code and a dash following the exchange. This is the format I will use for this database. And although you are not required to know all the syntax used in creating an input mask, I will mention the exclamation point designates that the numbers be filled in from left to right. The number 9 represents an optional digit and the 0 a required digit. If you wanted the area code to be a required entry, 
you would simply change the nines to zeros. Then, if someone were to enter a phone number minus its area code, Access would reject that entry. Clicking Next, we arrive at a screen asking how the phone number is to be stored. Storing the phone number without any symbols can speed up data processing in a very large database. Even though this is a tiny database, I'll store the numbers without the symbols. After clicking Next, I'll click Finish. Notice that the primary key is by the Publisher field. This is the field that this table has in common with the central bibliographic record table. Remember that the primary key field must contain all unique records with no duplication. The publisher field has no such duplications. Each publisher has a unique company name. I'll return to datasheet view. If Access gives you a prompt to save the table, go ahead and do so. Back in Datasheet view, you can see all the publisher information that has been entered so far. I'll add a fictitious publisher to this list. I'll click in the cell beneath Williams and Wilkins and type in my own publishing firm. Notice as I'm typing in the phone numbers, it's not necessary to enter the parentheses or dashes. Those are supplied by access. You only need to type in the numbers. Now I'll close out this table. Notice that I didn't press save, nor was I prompted to save. You would likely suspect that the data I entered has been lost, wouldn't you? Well, let's see. I'll open the table back up. I'll double click on Publisher. And if you look for the publisher alphabetically, you'll see that it was indeed saved to the table without my having pressed save. Data you enter into your datasheet is automatically saved. There's no need to press the save button. Keep this in mind as you enter your own data. If you type over existing data, that data is automatically erased and you can't get it back, except by clicking undo immediately following. However, if I manipulate the datasheet's physical layout in any way, I will be prompted to save. Let's have a look. Some of the text in the website column is cut off. To wind that column, I'll position my mouse on the border between website and contact names till it changes to a double-sided arrow. I may have to click to make the double-sided arrow appear. Then I'll click and hold down the mouse pointer and stretch the border so that all of the text appears in the website column. Another way to do this is to double click directly on that same border. So this time, as the contact name field needs to be stretched a little bit, I'll position my mouse between contact name and phone number and I'll simply double click. The column auto resize to display all the text. I'll close out the publisher table and I'll be prompted to save since I've changed the layout so I'll click yes to save. Then I'll open up the bibliographic record table. This is the central table of this database and you'll see how the publisher media format, and item location slash status tables act as source or parent tables whose information feeds into the bibliographic record table. This table has more columns than currently display on the screen. Let's have a look at the various fields. In the far left column is an item ID field. I'm going to stretch this a little so you can see that. I'll explain more about this field when I open up Design View. 
Next I have title and author. Then publisher with many of the listings we saw in the publisher table. Next I have the year of publication and if I scroll over we'll see that year is followed by the media format table. Again, we'll see media types listed here that were listed in the media format table. This is followed by the call number, date ordered, and lastly, item location slash status. The listings in this last column should look familiar to you as well as they come from the source table of the same name. I'll add a new Heart Sounds title to this database and you'll see how easy it is to pull information from the source or parent tables. First, I'll scroll back over to the left side of the table and next to where it says New, I'll click and enter my new title. I'll tab over next door and enter my author. And next I'll tab to the publishing company. And notice the down arrow that appears. I'm accessing a source table, so I'm going to click on the down arrow to pull up all the listings in the publisher table. I'm going to select the publishing company I recently added. Then I'll go next door. I'll add my year of publication. And then tab over to media format and this will be a DVD and then I'll enter my call number I'll put in the date ordered and the location status this is also a feeder table so I'll click on the down arrow and I'll select AV as my location Next, I'm going to go back to Design View for some more fine-tuning. 